photographers, you and photographers like you often ask me how they can take full advantage of their camera. That usually means they'd like to use a mode other than auto. But I'm not sure that mastering manual settings is key to taking full advantage. Learning how to use the tricks, hacks, and advanced settings for the auto modes is one way to take a little more control so that you can manage them for your creative needs, and that can add even more power than the manual controls to your photography toolkit. Now, I'm going to show you what they are, how they work, and how you can take advantage of them, as well as any gotchas that might trip you up when you try to use them. This video is about the Nikon Z series of cameras. Like most recent model cameras, there's an extensive menu system with lots of settings, all designed to help you fine-tune and manage the camera. This is the Z7. The Z6 is identical, except for a few items related to its resolution. The Z50 is missing a few of the features that I'm going to demonstrate. Uh, this video, recorded in June 2020, demonstrates the features in firmware 3.0. If you haven't updated, do that now. Even though this camera was released in November 2018, those firmware releases have kept this camera up to date over the last year and a half. I'm going to start with settings related to exposure, shutter, and focus. Then I'll show you the advanced white balance and color science settings, and how custom sets can switch settings between specific scenes and photographers. There's a table of contents in the description to navigate. I am going to assume that you are familiar with the camera and that you've mastered the basics of exposure, selecting the mode, program, shutter, or aperture priority, selecting a meter mode, adjusting aperture, shutter, and ISO. If not, there are links to my other videos about the Z series below. Let's start with the advanced ISO settings. Uh, first, what about those three low settings? When you take a photograph with low 0 0.3, 0 0.7, or 1, while it may map to a lower ISO setting, Nikon is indicating that the setting no longer conforms to its interpretation of the ISO standard. So, is there a difference? I'm showing you an out-of-camera JPEG with the standard picture control setting. This is the image using the low 1 ISO setting. That's effectively one stop less than ISO 64. The shutter speed is 1 60th. The same exposure meter reading can be achieved with the ISO at 64 and the shutter speed at 1 over 125, one stop less. The differences can be subtle, but there is a small decrease in contrast and color saturation. Check the images on Flickr from the link in the description. Going the other way, up to high 2 also indicates that the setting is outside of the bounds of standard ISO results. In this case, the amount of amplification applied to the image creates a noisy result, uh, equivalent to two stops higher than the highest ISO setting. If we return to 25,600 and instead slow the shutter speed to achieve the same exposure, the difference is dramatic. If content warranted, this would be a suitable image. Over to you to judge when you might want to use these settings in your practice. Our tolerance and your client's tolerance is an individual decision. Experiment and determine which is the highest ISO you can tolerate. Auto ISO is a useful and regular part of my photography workflow after determining my tolerance for the higher ISO settings. First, and this is not a menu setting, there is a base ISO setting. Turn the back dial with auto ISO on, and the camera will not go lower than this setting. Be careful. Don't set this too high. Then, in the menu, set the maximum to your tolerance so that the camera can't exceed that on its own. I might manually use a higher setting, but I want that selection to be explicit. 
there is an independent flash max ISO setting, although this is only used in conjunction with a speed light that offers slow sync flash. The minimum shutter speed setting can be set from 30 seconds to 1 over 4000, as well as auto. This setting is only in effect while the camera is in program or aperture priority. Uh, once you've set these, you may think that the ISO will never go higher and shutter speed will never go lower. Let me turn the dimmer on the lights down. At first, that is how it works. Shutter speed decreases until the minimum setting, then the ISO, flashing indicates that auto settings are in effect, increases until the maximum is reached. As light levels fall further, the shutter speed continues to fall below the set minimum. There's no way to stop this, so beware when using auto ISO and keep an eye on your shutter speed so that you can start to manually make the trade-off between shutter speeds that are lower than you like or ISOs that are higher than you like, or whether you're just going to stop shooting altogether. Auto also has an Easter egg. That right pointing chevron? To access settings adjusting the auto ISO for either a faster shutter or a lower ISO. The default for this image is 1 80th at 1000 or 1100. Change to faster and the shutter increases to 1 over 125 with an ISO of 1600. Slower is 1 60th at 800. This increases the flexibility of the auto ISO setting. Decisions made by program mode about shutter and aperture settings also seem arbitrary. Turning the back dial provides access to alternate settings, providing the same exposure result with higher and lower aperture and shutter settings. Depending on the scene and the lighting, the range may be large, as it is for this exterior, or small in a dark interior setting. I've demonstrated with auto ISO off, it's slightly less responsive with auto ISO on. In the menu, exposure adjustments typically use steps of one-third stop. I can't get used to half-step adjustments, and they are a little less granular, but they allow a larger range of changes to be made more quickly. With one-third, you'll get familiar numbers, f5.6, 6.3, 7.18, 8, and so on. With one-half, the settings would be 5.6, 6.7, 9.5, increasing more quickly. By default, pressing the EV key adjusts exposure compensation. When B2, easy exposure compensation, is on, in program or shutter priority, the front dial adjusts exposure compensation without having to press the EV key on top. In aperture priority, use the back dial. The auto reset feature returns EV to zero when the camera is turned off or when it enters standby mode. That can be useful if, like me, you tend to forget after you've adjusted it. B3 sets the size of the area used for the center weighted meter. 12 millimeters is the default, and for this scene sets the shutter to 1 over 160. As you can tell by the icon, average is larger, and for this image, the larger area indicates a 1 over 125 shutter speed. Some Nikon models allow the size to be selected, not here. In B4, all four meter modes can be modified from minus one to plus one, fine-tuning the meter reading if you feel it's always under or over your preference. The adjustment is made in one-sixth stop steps. Z-series cameras have three shutter modes. To take a fully silent image with no shutter sound, use the silent photography setting. This is a fully electronic and silent exposure. But it's not the only control over the shutter. By default, D5, the auto shutter setting, changes from the fully mechanical front and back to electronic front, when the shutter speed slows, reducing shutter shock, which can blur images. From what I've read, this would typically start under 1 60th of a second. You can also force either full mechanical or electronic front, so only those are used. The left side on-screen icon shows which shutter mode is selected, but auto is just A, 
it would be helpful to indicate which it is currently using. This is the shutter in a one second exposure. You can see it close the front curtain, open for the exposure, and then close. In electronic front, there is no initial close. That function is performed in the camera's electronics. Then the back curtain closes, ending the exposure. In silent, there is no shutter movement. A fully electronic may create image shear, where a fast-moving object tilts unnaturally. Electronic front may cause some artifacts at higher shutter speeds. It looks like motion blur on a defocused background. To eliminate some of those, Nikon limits electronic front to shutter speeds under 1 over 2000. After you've mastered the eye menu, selecting the focus mode, setting the focus area using tracking and touch, and here's a video that could help, uh, the menu has many more settings related to focus. The mode and area settings also appear on the photo shooting menu. Screen 3 for mode, area is on 4. At the bottom of screen 4, you'll find focus shift, which captures a series of images, each with a very slight change in the focus setting. It's useful for small objects and macro photography, when you're not sure what the exact focus is, or when you can't fully focus a subject and the images are going to be stacked together in Photoshop. There's a link to a more detailed demo in the description. The Custom Settings menu has more focus settings and options in Section A. The first two control the shutter and focus interconnect. When focus is selected, the camera waits until the focus system has completed its work before releasing the shutter. When you select Release, the shutter opens when you fully depress the shutter button, even if focus isn't quite ready. There are settings both for continuous shooting and for single shooting. In burst mode, you may prefer to save images even if the focus is slightly off while in single mode, you may prefer a slight delay to achieve the most accurate focus. Those are the defaults. And in most situations, you will not see much difference between the two, but in continuous, you may. Choosing focus slows burst speed. And note that when choosing a setting that isn't the default, an asterisk appears to let you know. The focus tracking setting determines how quickly the camera reacts to distractions. With the quick setting, the focus changes quickly when a new object enters the scene. Delayed stays with the currently focused subject. A4 controls eye detection, and when a face, or what the camera thinks is a face, is detected, when another object, like this wine label, becomes the autofocus target, disable this feature. Face and eye is a separate option. Note that eye detection is not available in video mode. Animal eye detection also not available for video. With a single point grid of 29 by 17, 493 focus points, navigation around the screen, if you're not using touch, could be time consuming. A5 turns off every other point. Coverage area is the same, only now there are 15 by 8, 120 points. While this seems an advantage, it also means you may not be able to get the point to exactly where you want it. And once a focus point is set, the camera retains the position. A6 saves independent points for landscape and portrait mode. A7 controls focus activation. By default, pressing the shutter release or pressing the AF on key activates the focus engine. AF on only disables the interconnect between the shutter and focus, so a shutter soft press no longer starts focusing. Photographers who only use the AF on key are practicing back button focus, which is a useful technique when the distance to the subject isn't changing, and you don't want to wait for a focus refresh with each shutter press. In A8, you can limit the number of focus areas available. This can be helpful to switch more quickly. If, for example, you only use single point and auto area, you can hide the others from the eye menu. 
once you reach the edges of the screen, the focus point stops. With A9, turn on Wraparound, and the point will jump from one edge around to the other. For example, from the left side to the right side, or the top to the bottom, when you continue scrolling. Use A10 to hide the focus point rectangle with separate options for manual focus and dynamic area. Although it can be distracting, I find the point helpful in manual mode, as it turns green when the object underneath is in focus. A11 improves low-light performance. An on-screen alert confirms it's working. A12 controls the green light that assists with low-light focus, so you can turn it off if it's disruptive. And by default, even in autofocus mode, the manual focus ring can be used to fine-tune focus after focus is activated and while the shutter release or AF on key is held down. A13 disables the lens's focus ring when using autofocus. Although the focus options are mostly grouped together, D10, which activates the peaking display, is also useful in manual focus. The detection level and the color used can be set. When on, the display shows the edges of the object in focus. Many video shooters find this useful. But they can also be distracting, and switching them on and off is cumbersome. F1 provides the ability to customize the eye menu, not all menu options are available, but peaking is, or use F2 to assign peaking to one of the customizable keys and switch it on and off. For lenses with a function key, it can be assigned to AF on, a feature I find even simpler than using back AF on key. You may also find it useful to activate tracking. And as long as we're here, if your lens has a third ring, it can be assigned to adjust the aperture, exposure compensation, or ISO. There's one more focus setting, <laughs> and I hesitate to mention it, as it can cause more trouble than the others, particularly for non-expert photographers. Page 2 of the Setup menu has an AF Fine Tune setting. You can save adjustments for up to 30 lenses. One value can be stored for each lens. Adjustment values range from 20 units closer to 20 units further. I suggest you identify a problem in your images first, and then devote some time to experimentation before you start using this feature. Now, let's get out of your auto white balance comfort zone but not too far. The default auto white balance setting is A1. In low light situations, A2, which favors the warmer glow of incandescent lighting, might capture the scene more realistically. But when you want a true white balance, A0 is the alternate. Here are the three images, A1, A2, and A0. For more control, use the Kelvin settings. Higher numbers are associated with outdoor sunlight. But if accuracy is what you're after, using a gray card to capture a custom white balance is recommended. However, note that even subtle shifts in cloud and light will alter this. Be aware and reset as often as needed. There are six custom slots, and those apply to both stills and video. Then, after selecting your white balance, there's a fine-tuning panel. Adjustment offers two control axes, amber to blue, as well as green to magenta. These are useful both when accuracy is your goal, but also when you have a creative intent. Beyond white balance and the picture control presets, Nikon offers many ways to customize their color science or to create your own. Each of the eight basic styles are presets, which can be customized with a selection of further adjustments. I can't begin to show you the range available, but starting with the default settings for neutral, let me demonstrate some of the possibilities. 
Most of the adjustments can be made in one quarter step increments to three up and down. These are all arbitrary designations. The detail settings can be adjusted as a group or through individual sharpening and clarity ranges. If I adjust quick sharp to the minimum, this is the result. Uh, this is the maximum. Although the extremes don't help to illustrate the subtlety and nuance that can be achieved with these adjustments, let me also show you the contrast range from minus 3 to plus 3, and the saturation range from minus 3 to plus 3. As with other settings, the asterisk indicates a preset is off its defaults. And the more you experiment with these, the more you will appreciate them. But remember, these settings are applied to JPEG images, not the RAW files. And I'm accessing picture controls from the iMenu overlay. They're also available in the main menu, where there's no interactive preview. But you will find a little more control, including the ability to reset to the default. Interestingly, resetting the photo shooting menu returns picture control to the auto default, but does not reset your individual adjustments. Manage Picture Controls has the ability to save up to nine custom controls. These appear after the basic controls and the 20 filters. After fine-tuning a default, name and save it as a custom control. Controls can be renamed and deleted and stored on your memory card, where it can be retrieved using copy to camera. These files are stored in the Nikon Custom PC folder named PicCon. They are deleted when a card is formatted, so unless you're going to dedicate a card just to store settings, I recommend you back them up to a folder on your computer. When you format a card, a procedure you should do in the camera, you can then copy your custom files back to the card using your computer. But let's also ask Nikon for a smarter format feature that doesn't erase these files. Uh, for those of us who are frequently changing multiple settings between shots, the Z mode dial has three custom settings, U1 to U3. The idea here is that you configure the camera to your preferred settings from the photo and video shooting menus, the custom settings, the mode dial, and the exposure settings. A few exceptions like interval timer are listed in the menu. Then, in the setup menu, select save user settings, select a position, and save. In my experience, it takes a few passes to get the full configuration right, so just save again to overwrite. Uh, turn the mode dial to the setting you wish to use, and it's loaded. If you make changes while you're using a custom set, they won't be saved unless you resave. That's good! If you don't want to accidentally modify the setting, but bad, if you realize you needed to update a setting, and then forgot to save. There is a reset option. I don't see the value. And once you realize the power of this feature, you'll also realize that three is a small number. As an example, I created two custom settings for wide dynamic range scenes. U2 is configured to take a three-shot, one-step exposure bracket. U3 is configured to take HDR images, which requires RAW to be off. Now, without custom, it's a pain to switch between these configurations, but custom settings makes it easy, and that works fine. Until I decided to add burst to U2 to take the bracket images continuously. I didn't notice at first, as HDR overrides the burst setting, but drive modes are not saved in a custom set. Another thing that's not included are the playback settings. And for the exposure bracket, I don't need to see the last image, but for the in-camera processed HDR picture, I really do. Sadly, image review setting isn't included in a custom set. Now, you may be wondering why I saved these as two and three. That's because when you switch the mode dial out of the custom sets, it doesn't revert to your previous settings. So I've set one aside for that. Before I switch to two or three, I first save my current set as one so that I can quickly return, as I said. 
three is a very small number. A minor shortcoming is that the only way to confirm the settings associated with a custom set is to select it and then scroll through the settings. Clearly, there's room for improvement, but I suspect that in general, photographers don't use this feature. Please let me know if you do, and if there are any specific ways you find this useful. Uh, wait a few pages further down to save load settings. This saves a file to the memory card with all the camera's current settings, including the custom sets. This file is stored in the root directory named ncset. You can use this to retrieve settings or to transfer them between cameras. And like saved picture controls, this file is also deleted when the camera is formatted. The manual provides a long list of the menu items that are included, like image review, and some of the exclusions like date and time. My feature request here is to have the settings saved as XML files so they're easily editable. Now, maybe you've noticed my careful dance around Nikon's terminology. I don't have positive associations with the word user, so I've used the term custom. Well, there's certainly more to discuss and more features to explore in depth, both with the Z series and with other cameras. Most recent cameras, even those in the entry-level category, have some or most of these features, although they may not all work the same way. In general, camera manuals are excellent sleep aids, but if you can't stay awake, you can usually read enough to get started. After that, you'll need to spend time experimenting to learn the what, the how, and the when a setting might be useful in your toolkit. While you're trying to improve your skills, continue creating until your memory card is full and your battery is depleted. And I do enjoy interacting with you. Please post your relevant questions and civil comments below. I would like to thank all of my subscribers. Your interest and support is greatly appreciated. And if you're thinking about subscribing, Remember that it's still a free option, entirely without obligation. Thanks for watching.